Hey, we're back with Think Tech Tech Talks here on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel in the, in the one o'clock block. We have Fred Rohde, who is a founder and president of DR Fortress, which is quite an amazing institution here in Hawaii uh, in the information technology sector. Welcome so much, Fred, uh, to come on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah, great to be here. So DR Fortress, you told me a minute ago, was uh, 14 years old. Um, and uh, you were there at the outset. And, uh, and I remember having a tour. I think you gave me the tour back when at the airport. And I was so, you know, I was so dazzled with the fact that the walls of that facility were like concrete all around. It was something out of a movie. It was like three feet thick. It was, you know, amazing security and, and all these servers everywhere, servers. And I said, wow. And then I understood, this is recollection from at least 10 years ago anyway, um, that you actually had backup of all of that in other places too. So this is really a fortress. You don't call it fortress for nothing, eh? So, yeah. <laughs> so tell us about the founding of the company, what it was intended to do and how it has evolved since then. Yeah, so back when you came, we were Pihana Pacific. So, That's right. Yeah. So. Um, uh, we had data centers throughout Asia Pacific, uh, Hong Kong, Australia, Japan, uh, Korea, Singapore, LA, and our headquarters was Honolulu. And in 2003, uh, the beginning of 2003, the end of 2002, we actually merged with a company called Equinix. And then Equinix is the largest neutral data center in the planet uh, and growing, they still are. And then in 2005, we filled up our Honolulu site and they were gonna just kind of skeleton crew mothball the site. And so me and my partner, um, Ben Doe at the time, said, why don't we go buy the place? And I said, that, that's a little bit difficult, it's millions of dollars, what are we gonna do? And uh, it kind of latched on and then we uh, grabbed on two other partners, Jeff Brown and um, Rosa White. And we raised over $16 million at the time and acquired the facility and expanded it. So we went from 12,000 square feet to, uh, I can't even remember back then, um, probably another uh, 10,000 square feet that we acquired and then doubled our uh, power systems. And so that was back in 2007 where we did that first expansion. Uh, we did another expansion um, in 2016. And we basically, we moved out of our offices, turned that into data center space, um, did another 72 racks. And then in January of this year, January 15th of this year, uh, we got uh, investment from GI Partners. And they basically are coming into the Honolulu market to expand our market. So we're doing another expansion. That's the, another 130 racks that we're about to do. Um, we're knocking down the wall and we're going uh, diamond head side of our complex and we're taking uh, down um, some space and we'll make it contiguous. And uh, we've upgraded our UPS system for that. We've already done that uh, this past year. So we'll just have to run uh, systems over there and drop in cabinets. So it should be pretty quick. We're looking at fourth quarter of having this live for our customers. Uh, but yeah, it's been a long journey. We're, we're now 50,000 square feet and uh, after this expansion will be about 600 uh, cabinets. So yeah, a long way from when you first came down. You should come down again uh, once the yeah. uh, COVID thing is over. I, well, <laughs> that's, that's a vague invitation right now. <laughs> yeah. If you're willing to just throw on a mask and walk around with me, uh, you can come down anytime. Okay, I may very well do that because I'm so excited about having this kind of facility in Honolulu. This is This is really not limited to local. This is more than that and uh you know you're servicing clientele many places so uh, first some definition of terms what is a rack and how many servers can fit on a rack and do you have more than one customer on that rack or do you have only one customer on that rack yeah so we have banks and hospitals and carriers um content providers uh all the way to retail stores uh so it depends we, we have resellers that will buy a whole cabinet it's about <clears throat> excuse me it's about seven feet tall it, fits about 45 RU worth of, and, and one RU is a rack unit, looks like a little pizza box. Um, and so that cabinet can be one customer and one customer can have 30 racks and it could be one customer 
doing it for many small customers that just need one server, mm. all the way down to uh, virtual um, servers that customers can buy off of our cloud marketplace. We have different cloud providers that they can buy from and they can buy virtual servers. So the, is the cloud with you or the cloud somewhere else that you allow access to a cloud in a, in a remote place? Uh, both. So we have cloud providers that have nodes in multiple locations, uh, could be uh, here and on the United, in the United States continental US. Um, and some of them are actually in other countries as well. So it just depends on the provider. And we have, we're a marketplace. So we have many different providers. And in fact, we're about to launch a new product. I don't think Bill wants me to say yet because we're going to do a press release on that product. Um, <laughs> we'll allow an on-ramp onto uh, some hyperscale clouds as well. Uh, okay. I have a million questions, if you don't mind. Uh, some of them are probably, you know, you each other lower, here. Lower, uh, <laughs> lower education questions, but... Okay, so you're in there and you have this, um, you know, thick concrete walls, the same facility that I saw, right, but bigger. Um, and there's a couple of things that I, I would, if I were your client, I would like to know about. Number one is um, um, you, you have, so, <clears throat> so do I have limited access? Do I have the exclusive access to this cabinet? In other words, nobody gets in there but me. Nobody touches those servers but me. Is that the way it works? So uh, we have an access list. So the customer ha has access to an online portal and they tell us who has access to the facility and what level of access that individual has. Can they bring in equipment? Can they go to their cabinet? Can they order services online? And we enforce it. So the customer is telling us who has access to that cabinet. Um, they have a combination a lock on their cabinet. Uh, some of them have cages, so they have a key lock and then they'll have combinations on the cabinets inside that cage. Um, so they're basically telling us what they need for their, usually it's like an audit. So sometimes they have to have, you know, federal audits. Sometimes it's FDIC. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. It's, uh, just depends on the customer. And then they tell us, okay, these vendors are allowed in, but could you escort them? Or they're not allowed in. We're going to send our employees down to do the work to escort them down. Um, and we're just enforcing it. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, all these servers the same. I imagine that everybody likes his own kind of server, you know, one brand or another, one manufacturer or another. Um, are they the same in size? Are they the same in capacity? I mean, or is it anything and everything goes, you just fill up the space um, with whatever server you like? Is that the way it works? Yeah, so there's, um, there's servers, there's firewalls, there's routers, there's switches, there's a bunch of different things that customers are using, storage area networks. Um, the, usually the, the conformity is within the width. So usually it's 19 inch CPE. Sometimes you get an oddball where it's 23 inch CPE, but then it can be any rack unit size. Uh, we have a customer that has a terabit router that's seven feet tall. So it's all 45 rack units is the machine. It was, it was interesting. They brought it in. It looked like a coffin. I'm like, what are you bringing in? Oh, it's a <laughs> Then they stood it up into the rack. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> So suppose a customer comes to you, Fred, and he says, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know from service and routers and what have you and firewalls. Um, you get it for me. You, you know, you, you, uh, you, I'll tell you my specs. Get me a server. Get me a router. Get me whatever equipment I need. And uh, I'll, I'll pay you for it. Do you ever do that? Or do you always require the customer to do it himself? So usually we're working with partners. So, um, you know, there's Paxa and Data House and WWT and IBM, Sirius, all these guys, usually they're the ones selling them a solution. Uh, we're the home for that solution. Usually the customers don't want to have their own, you know, uh, data set, um, you know, in their office because now you have to power uh, the UPS, the crack units, the chiller outside and keep the, the, the thing on all time, even if you're just powering one device. Uh, so with us, we're doing all of that at scale, and we can usually do it cheaper um, than what it's going to cost for your electric bill to power all that for like just a few servers. So we're working with those providers um, that are selling them a solution set. Hey, I'm selling you mainframe, I'm selling you Oracle, um, you know, boxes, I'm selling Dell, selling HP, whatever. Um, they're creating the solution for the customer. Then usually they're coming to us and saying, hey, this is the power requirements that I need for all this equipment that I just sold the customer. Uh, can you price out how many racks that would be and how much power I'm going to need 
in that rack. And that's how we kind of collaborate together. There's been instances where we have customers from like other countries that, hey, we, we, we only want to work with you to, to do all of this for us. And so we'll do that just from a billing exercise, but we're not usually doing it to where I'm trying to procure all that hardware for the customers because that's usually our partners um, kind of. Right, but right. that's good. That's a good way to do it too, because you have different, different strokes for different folks, different, you know, opinions and recommendations. And uh, <clears throat> I guess you get, you get all boats rising that way. Yeah. So the, the other, the other aspect is you're providing essentially security. You're providing power so that these servers keep running. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're providing air conditioning, I suppose, although <clears throat> I know a lot of computers these days are, are uh, water cooled anyway, and I'm not sure they need it. I, I, I'm going to ask you about that. And um, you're, you're providing security. Did I mention that? Security, air conditioning, um, power, and I suppose you're providing, I guess then, that's, that's about it, right? That's what you, so you're giving them a safe home, so to speak. Uh, oh, and you're providing access to connect, connectability, physical connectability. That's the one I was thinking of, <clears throat> all those things. And, and so let's talk, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So let's talk about, for example, security. Uh, I remember this is built like a fort. That's why you call it fortress, I'm sure. Um, and it was really thick walls. Nobody's going through those walls. But how about the doors? Uh, how do you make sure that it's totally secure against some bad actor? Yeah, so we have, uh, we actually have glass doors in the front um, to, for access into the facility for the general public. Those have a film on it. So you can actually, uh, it can, it can actually handle small firearms, small missiles, that kind of stuff, but it's mainly for hurricanes. So if something project, turns into a projectile like a missile, um, it would hit our doors. It wouldn't be able to penetrate. Um, usually what the customers are doing is uh, they're pre-registering so they can get into the data center. And what we do is we scan their eyes. And so it does a, an algorithm off of their iris, off of both their eyes, and it's a video. So they just basically move towards the camera and then it'll pop the door open for them and then they're into the lobby. And that's for anybody that's pre-registered. Now, they don't have access to actually go into the data center because the, any second door to get into the actual data center is dual authentication. So they need their eyes plus this card, and the only way to get the card is for them to actually sign in with security and give them their ID in exchange for this card so that they've signed in for the day. And they get through the second door, use your eyes plus the card, now you're in. And then there's a third door, and that third door is just your eyes again. And then they come in through there, and then once they get to their cabinet, then they have a combination lock or their cage, they'll have a key. Um, and then they can actually touch their stuff. So it's a multi tiered layer. And again, a lot of that's for audits, you know, for the HIPPO or sure, the, for military, especially. Yeah. yeah exactly. so, so, what what about, uh, you know, the possibility we talked about this uh, um, to have the cloud also? To have uh, you, you spoke about how DR Fortress is connected with other other such data centers uh, hither and yon, so I could have my uh, my servers with my family jewels sitting in, in DR Fortress. But if if something goes wrong, I'm going to have a mirror image somewhere else, right? Can I have that? How does that work? Yeah, so we do have cloud providers that have multiple sites, and what you can do, or even cloud providers like an Amazon, Azure, Google, the big uh, hyperscale clouds. Uh, we do have on ramps in our data center that you can actually plug into our switch and we'll get you there. Um, and it's and it's really simple. It's like an online portal. That's the stuff that I didn't want to share because Rosa has a bit of a history. <laughs> we'll meet again and we'll talk about that. Um, but we have cloud providers that you can actually pick the node where you want. And so we have um, this one um, system that you choose. And there's multiple systems. Again, there's different providers because we have a marketplace of people in here. Uh, so you can choose to be on their system and then you can choose like San Francisco, Arizona or whatever site you want. You could choose Switzerland if you wanted to, um, to actually set up another node and then use that as your backup. Or you can do active active. So um, we have different providers that can provide different things like that. But again, you're just buying um, it's another system in another location. And then uh, you would basically need software to actually do active active or do right but it's talking talking to each other and a lot so of <clears throat> worse comes to worse um, is somewhere else just in case yeah, exactly so uh, only the one the ones that I've seen do that are the ones that have 
um, audits that have to do geodiverse. A lot of times, if they're smaller customers and they're local smaller customers, they're using us as their primary, and then maybe their backup is um, on their location, right? Because uh, they, they used to have a data center at their location, and they're like, okay, well, I can't afford to do it yet again, but I'll do a watered-down ver version at my location. Um, or they use us as a primary site for hardware, and then they use the cloud as their backup. So it just depends on, you know, what they're trying to accomplish, because there's many different disasters that can happen, right? There's tsunami, there's hurricane, uh, but it's usually not what happens. It's usually, hey, Joe is changing the light bulb and hit the sprinkler head in the office. <laughs> and blood <laughs> in the office. I lost power from HECO just in my office. Oh, my God. So it's like the everyday anomaly that you're really having to fight against. Um, so just coming into our data center um, is like 100% better instead of having your office. So it just depends on the customer and like what they're trying to accomplish. Because we do yeah. have other customers that use us as primary, but they do have stuff on the mainland. They need that for their audit as well. So how big do I have to be? I mean, uh, I, I don't imagine this is for um, the individual consumer home, you know, a, a computer at home person, uh, or even a, a small office. This is going to be for bigger than that. Uh, where, you know, before it reaches economies of scale, before, you know, you get a real return on the investment, so to speak, you're going to have to be a certain size. What size would that be, Fred? So it used to be, um, it used to be a certain size mattered, especially when you're doing physical, but because we have resellers that can sell you just, uh, mm -hmm. you, um, you can actually be, come in through one of our resellers on that and cloud nowadays, you can, as an individual, sign up on our cloud system, right? And you pay $50 a month, right? And we've had like individuals do that for gaming servers and things of that nature. In fact, we're working with a gaming company to actually put a pop here um, so that those gaming things will be faster because we are the internet exchange, right? We're the hub of the entire internet for Hawaii. Uh, so a lot of times they'll do that just because they don't want to have to go to the mainland and back um, for their stuff, like the point of sale systems and things like that where putting it on the mainland, it does, just doesn't function properly. So having it here using one of our local cloud providers somewhere in our marketplace, or sometimes they're coming in, actually plugging into our internet exchange um, just to keep all the local traffic local, which makes it faster and cheaper for them as well. So even a, even a small user or a small company would benefit by having um, some connection with the data center, even if it's through a third party contract or distributor person. Um, and what kind of speeds could I achieve if I do that uh, up and down? Do you, do you have an idea? Uh, well, uh, it all depends on your location because our location, we're where the carriers buy from carriers. So um, we have an unlimited amount of bandwidth inside our site, right? Um, where usually at your, you know, your home, you're doing, you know, 100 meg, you know, maybe get gig, where we're doing terabit. Right, because the carriers are buying from carriers in here. That's the whole terabit router that I was telling you about. Um, you know, we're doing thousand gigabit speeds and higher, um, where you're not really hearing hundred gig or whatever at your office. Usually, you're at hundred meg to gig um, is what you're, and maybe ten gig. Uh, but in here, we do hundred gig. Um, so like, bandwidth prices are super cheap here. So I have some customers that just come in just to buy bandwidth because they save so much money. I had one customer on the on the North Shore paying twenty thousand dollars a month for one gig. That same one gig in our data center is like eight hundred dollars, right? So that's a big difference. Yeah. So you know, not everybody's having to pay that outrageous price, but the carriers in here because we sell to all the carriers, you have choice. You can choose. Hawaiian Tel, Spectrum, CenturyLink, Hurricane Electric, um, Telstra, GTA from Guam, America Samoa, OPT from Tahiti, uh, we have Zeo and GTT. So there's so many different providers inside our site that you can buy from that it lowers the bandwidth price. And then you just have to worry about what you get on your office side. Um, and that would be your choke point normally. Yeah. Right? But that would be a physical choke point on the, you know, <laughs> because I'd be connected, my office would be connected with you, and then I have the benefit of whatever speed you have. Um, and the choke point would be um, somewhere 
in the cable between you and my my, yeah, whatever my you machine. Have at your house or your office is usually yeah. because yeah. we're the again the hub of the internet. All the carriers they plug into our internet exchange, and so Hawaiian Tel and Spectrum. That's we're the intersection point to where when all those people from Hawaiian Tel users are talking to Spectrum users because they're just sending emails or trying to get to each other's websites, um, whatever, we're the intersection point. So they plug into us. And so anytime Hawaiian Tel needs to get to Spectrum, they go through us, right? Through that yeah. internet. And because we're that point, all of the carriers do that. And then all the content guys, all your search engine stuff, all your you know, social media content, like all of those are our customers and they have what's called a content distribution network inside our site on that exchange. So we speed up the internet. It's not a service that we offer. It's just what happens because of the marketplace, all the carriers and all the content guys exchanging traffic with one another and the cloud happens to sit off that same system. So um, I got to sit down for this answer, but does this mean that my internet at home, which in my case comes from uh, Spectrum, um, is going through your exchange. And like in the office, we you know have another one going through uh, your exchange. And your exchange is connected by, I suppose, not, not, uh, not satellite, but cable to whatever cables are uh, servicing Hawaii. Is that, is that the right schematic for it? Kind of. Um, so ultimately what will happen is anything that's popular in Hawaii and uh, you know, YouTube, popular YouTube, that sits inside our data center, right? And so if you were searching anything popular on Google, you would potentially be going through our data center. If you send an email to somebody that's in Hawaiian Telecom, you would go through our data center, right? Because it needs to exchange. That's what that is. That's a hub, it's a neutral point for all of the carriers and all the content providers, whoever else wants to participate, they can exchange traffic with one another without having to go all the way to the mainland and back for something that's destined for Hawaii. So that speeds up the internet. But that's something you offer. The exchange is your part of this. Yeah. That's our, your, your cabinet, so to speak. Yeah, so we're selling that to the carriers. So we're selling to Spectrum and Hawaiian Tel and Google's and all, all those guys so that your experience downstream um, is what you feel the difference. So when you start to feel things faster, that means they're probably on the internet exchange at that point. If it's a little bit slower, it's probably sitting on the mainland still. Mm -hmm. We're still working on trying to get them to put in an edge node. Does, does this mean that um, if I watch a movie on uh, say Netflix, it's coming through you? Uh, that one's a hard one because we've been trying to get Netflix to pop our site. Um, <laughs> Because we're not an, an ISP, it's harder for them because they'd have to put in a node that can plug in the internet exchange and hit all the ISPs at once. And so they haven't agreed to do that with us yet. But I think um, there's probably some carriers that do have little cash nodes. Um, and I know Akamai does do some hosting. And so Akamai is actually sending us more stuff inside their room. Interesting. Interesting. So it could be for Netflix, but they do like everything. Um, you know, all your iOS updates on your iPhone, Akamai hosts that here. Um, they do like CNN and Disney and some other content. Um, so they'll host that here. So I don't know exactly what content they have in there, um, but I know they're bringing more. Um, same with Cloudflare and Facebook and the rest of the, the guys that do this distribution stuff. Um, so it just depends on what you're doing. If, it's, if it seems really fast, because we got Verizon on our, um, uh, through one of the carriers, so on your Verizon phone, if you are on Verizon and you type in drfortress.com, it comes up super quick, right? But if you're well, Verizon is very fast, yeah. Yeah, but they peer here locally, right? And so they're on the exchange through somebody else um, to make it fast like that. And if you've ever seen, you know, the little circle of death going on, you're probably going all the way to the mainland and back. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. So what about 5G? Do you have any special, I mean, involvement in the 5G, uh, in the evolution toward 5G? Uh, not uh, directly, through our customers, obviously. You know, we have um, some customers coming in doing that. Um, they basically need to, to aggregate that. Um, they're having a hard time a little bit with, uh, you know, um, trying to get, they, they need way more um, cell towers out there now. Just yes, right, right. Um, those, those that have a shorter range, they can grab more people. 
but now you're talking about having one like on every other light pole or on every other utility pole. So they're still trying to work through the deals on like, well, how do you pay for that if you're going to yeah. charge you on every single pole? Yeah. Uh, so I think 5G is a little bit behind in Hawaii, um, but I mean, it's coming, right? It's That's the next wave and that's, um, you know, like it or not, that you know, I don't know if birds are going to be falling from the sky when you do gig to your phone, but I think that's what I think that's Let me unpack some more. Um, so, of, of course, you've got to have power, and I imagine you have redundant power just in case the, the external power goes out. What, what do you do for that, and, and um, uh, how, how, how quick is it that it trips in? Yeah, so we have what's called an uninterruptible power supply. We have multiple um, systems. And those systems basically are what's feeding our customers. We have a um, VLRA system and a, a, a lithium ion battery system. And so we have a 1.25 megawatt one and a 250 um, uh, system. And that's what's really powering the facility. And then the carriers actually take DC power, it's another system, but that's what's powering the customer. It goes through the UPS all the time. Yeah. yeah. Always yeah. going to the customers that way. And then yeah. we have five generators. Um, so three for the customer load and two for the cooling load, a mechanical load. And what happens is if we lose power from the utility, um, the customers stay on through the UPS system. And then the generators come on and refeed um, those UPS systems to keep it up running indefinitely. Indefinitely? Yes. Yeah, because you have the generators. So you can go. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we have um, day tanks on all the fuel. And then we have a reserve 10,000 gallon system. And so we just have to keep on filling up that 10,000 gallon reserve and then we can run forever. As that's, long a lot of, that's a lot of gallons spread. <laughs> we don't want to have to do that. It's, it's getting expensive, but um, yeah, we, we have a minimum of eight days of fuel right now um, because you know, we want to make sure we outpace our refueling contract. We don't have to worry about you know, in 24 to 48 hours having to get fuel. Um, we can last for a while before we have to uh, think about refueling. So part of that uh, is keeping the place cool um, because you have to achieve a certain temperature for optimal performance of, of all these uh, servers and equipment. Um, so what do you have for that? I, I recall when I, when I made my visit that it was pretty chilly in there. <laughs> what are you using? How do you, how do you achieve that? Yeah, so we have... Um, we have two systems. We have a um, DX system, which we use for um, some hospitals that we have inside the site. Uh, we have a, a whole room that has like zero water. It's all FM 200 and it's all um, refrigerant and whatnot. So that, that room actually um, is specifically designed to have, you know, do 30, 208, three phase power on every rack. And it runs off that system. Um, we have 13 of those units and then they all work in unison. Uh, each one's in its own pod. Um, but that specific area for high power density in hospitals. Uh, the rest of the entire data center uses a chill water loop. And then those hit computer room AC systems. And then we have what's called N plus one. So we have primary that's on, and then we have a backup, uh, just in case that primary is either being serviced or if it actually goes down. Uh, we have three 210 ton chiller units. Um, I that's up enough for an office building. <laughs> yes, we can actually probably cool the entire complex, but it's specifically just to um, cool computers, right? Because uh, you have a lot of uh, drives, you have a lot of fans that are basically, it's creating heat and you you don't want that server to heat up because if it gets too hot, it'll do a self um, protect and shut itself off because it's uh, making sure it doesn't melt the CPU. Um, so we got to make sure that we maintain a specific uh, temperature because it doesn't matter how much power we give you, if we can't cool it, your stuff will automatically shut itself off. So we're trying to maintain 71 degrees, plus or minus three degrees um, in the facility and um, between uh, 40 to 60% humidity. So you're, you're trying to do a balance of both because if you get too cold and too humid, you know what happens to your you know, can with condensation, you don't want that happening in your data center. Right, 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 right. So <clears throat> you, um, you're expanding, I don't know if that's happened or about to happen. Uh, you're adding a, a whole new, a whole new uh, wing, essentially, um, onto this facility, uh, and it's going to be state of the art. And uh, you, you issued a press release about that a couple of days ago. 
Um, can you talk about it a little and tell us what, what the plan is? Yeah, so we're taking uh, over some space inside adjacent to our current data center. We're gonna knock down the wall. We're gonna basically do another 140 cabinets. So we have um, some large customers if they needed you know, 30 racks, I can't do that today. And so we need this space to actually do bigger um, customers. Um, so we're just trying to stay in front. You know, once you reach 80% capacity, you have to build. Uh, so that's what we're doing. And ultimately, our plan is to do more. So we want a second site uh, on island as well. Um, so once we finish this, that's going to be on our next horizon. And then we have partners on the mainland that we'll, we work with if anybody needs anything on the mainland. But mm. uh, the current partners that we got that invested in there, we, they really want to invest heavily in Hawaii. They see that the bulk of the customers that are out there today, they're still using their office for their data center. And on the mainland, people don't do that. Um, so we've been doing this education process. So I'm like, hey, it's not as expensive as you think. A lot of times we can do a, a you know, a return on investment, um, cost analysis, and tell them, hey, with what you're paying just for your power um, to run these things with keeping it cold all the time, we can actually just give you a rack um, for cheaper. And then what you can save in buying more bandwidth inside our site at cheaper rates, um, a lot of times we're going to save you money and give you a better performance, help you meet your audits, things like that. So that's what we're trying to do with this expansion is also reach out to the existing Hawaii community that, hey, we're here um, to help. Once you come into this space, we're kind of like Ala Moana, where we don't do a lot of stuff. We're the location where all of these things that you can buy exist in one place. And a lot of times it can save you a ton of money or give you a better solution or both. Yeah. One last area I wanted to ask you about, and that's um, you know the, the dynamic that's going on right now. Uh, and I would make some guesses, um, COVID, more people working at home. Um, COVID, more, more people working on the computer instead of in an office setting where they have other ways of communicating. Uh, more people, um, more, more people using Zoom, uh, which requires more bandwidth. Um, and furthermore, that these things are probably going to remain in place after COVID subsides, knock wood, that is soon, because as soon as COVID subsides, I'm coming out to take another tour. So uh, is, it, is this affecting you? Uh, is this part of your planning? Uh, where do you see it all going? Because um, obviously information technology rules the earth and it's gonna be ruling the earth much more in the time to come. How does that affect DR Fortress? Yeah, so it hasn't been really affecting us directly. It's been affecting our customers. So those that are in the hospitality industry, those are the ones being hit. And then we feel it as it, they need to shrink or they need um, reprieve on their contract. So we've been feeling that, but we know what's coming, right? You mentioned 5G. Um, you know, that's going to be the next wave. Everybody's preparing for that. Uh, there's also this thing called edge um, computing where, uh, you know, they're talking about pushing the cloud to the edge and getting it to the regions and getting it to micro data centers for, you know, the next, um, you know, they're talking about uh, the, these uh, you know, autonomous cars and, uh, you know, cloud right. edge for, you know, whatever is coming next. I mean, we didn't even have TikTok not too long ago, and that's like a billion dollar corporation that's creating content constantly. Yeah. So technology isn't going away and, and just look at the apps on your phone or, you know, your kid, you know, playing a game on, on their computer. Um, all that sits in data centers. It, it doesn't sit in offices all around the world that, that it becomes more mission critical. That's when you need a data center. Um, and then the networking, the, um, you know, how many times you connect up to different countries or different mainland ones, that becomes extremely important. So the internet exchange is only growing. Um, it's exponentially going to grow once you get 5G in here uh, because everybody's going to want to also push their cloud to the edge and hit all those networks one time um, to make it faster because sometimes um, these calculations need to be happening you know, in nanoseconds and, and not have the latency of going all the way to the mainland and back. So you know, it's just like church, right? If, if everybody went to church, there's not enough churches. If everybody actually used the data center, there's actually not enough data center space. 
<laughs> You're in exactly the right place at the right time. All the influences and confluences are coming in your direction, Fred. What a thing. And I know you, and you'll still talk to me, <laughs> even with additional data centers hither and yon. Thank you so much for joining us. Fred Rohde, president and founder of DR Fortress. Aloha, Fred.